You know, in the Bible, Jesus said that he wants us to live the abundant life. We were just reading it uh, in our scripture at the beginning of the program. But for many believers, the meaning of living the abundant life has become quite misunderstood. And author Mal Max Wilkins, he spent three decades as a pastor and in his new book, Focusing My Gaze, he tells Christians to stop equating the abundant life with the American dream. Max, welcome to Hope Today. Well, thank you so much, Tom and Sydney and Amy. It's great to be with you today. And Amy, congratulations on your anniversary. That's, that's just awesome. Thank you. Well, let me ask you, uh, Max, uh, again, your book's called Focusing the Gaze, uh, Your Gaze, uh, My Gaze. I want to read the first, first line out of the introduction. It says, the focus of my gaze will determine the state of my being. Could you unpack that line for us a little bit? What does that mean? Well, that, that is the central theme of the book, Tom, and um, the, the idea is that what we choose to pursue, where we choose to focus our attention will, will have a great deal to do with how our life turns out. Jesus says in John 10.10 10, that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. But we, we have to look at that in the, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount when in, in Matthew chapter 6 in verse 33, after Jesus had said, look, your heavenly father knows what you need, but you worry about all of these things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, what kind of car you're going to drive. Jesus didn't say that, but it's implied in, in there. But, but Jesus says, look, just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be given unto you. Jesus is, is encouraging us to do what Hebrews encourages us to do, which is to set aside all the things that entangle us and to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And the pathway to the abundant life is found in focusing our gaze on Jesus. Um, in this Christmas season, I, I, I love to sing Away in a Manger, but I've been thinking recently, Christmas is far more about discovering the way in the manger. Um, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And if we want that life, uh, we not only have to live into the truth, but seek the way of Jesus. And so I, I really do think the focus of our gaze the focus of our attention will determine the state and quality of our life. You know, you just quoted a verse there about that lay aside, lay aside the, th the, the it says the things which in, uh, encumber us and, and, the, and the sin which entangles us. Well, we know about laying aside sin, but sometimes we have to lay aside good things, things that seem right and proper in a, in a normal circumstance to really have God's best and to find uh, God's plan and purpose for us. Absolutely. In fact, I, I'm convinced that this thief that Jesus speaks about in John 10:10, 10, 10, who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, is representative of of not only our enemy Satan, but the, the worldly things that will distract us and just rob us, uh, destroy the dreams that God has placed within our hearts, um, uh, steal from us the life that the Lord came to give us. And I think the temptations that Satan gave to Jesus when he was in the wilderness are indicative of these kinds of distractions. Satan was tempting Jesus to take shortcuts to get goods, um, to look good, or to feel good. And that's the same temptations we all face, to focus our gaze on pursuing things or pursuing power or pursuing position. And Jesus is saying so clearly to us, just pursue the kingdom. Because you have, the irony of Satan's temptations of Jesus in the wilderness is that God wanted Jesus to have everything Satan was promising him. But God wanted to put them into Jesus' life in his way. Satan wanted Jesus to take shortcuts to find them a different way. And Jesus, of course, was able to resist that and, and to reject it and follow the way of the Lord. And Jesus is just asking us to follow his way to receive all those blessings that the Lord wants to put into our lives. Well, your book has three different gazes, you mentioned. In fact, it's subtitled, Beholding the Upward, Inward, Outward Mission of Jesus. So 
I need you to break those down for us. First of all, the upward gaze. What is that? I, I'm, just from the sound of it, it's looking towards God. How do you, how do you, uh, you know, unpack that for us? Well, the book, interestingly enough, because it's a book about Jesus, but we focus on the story of Isaiah seeing the Lord high and lifted up and exalted. And as Isaiah sees the Lord, he also sees the seraphim flying around and, and, and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of your glory. And it occurred to me that if those seraphim are telling the truth, and by definition, I think seraphim can only tell the truth. They're the voices of, around the throne of God. If the whole earth is truly full of the glory of God, then what circumstance can we find ourselves in that would be so dark? What challenge so trying? What, what difficulty so deep that the glory of God is absent? And I think that the central truth of, of that declaration of those angels is that the glory of God does fill the whole earth. So it means wherever we are, whatever circumstance we're in, God is at work. God's glory is present. And so the issue becomes less about do we do we um, is God present and more about where do we where are we focusing? Are we choosing to focus on the darkness and what's broken and what's wrong? Or are we seeking to turn our attention to the glory of God? Isaiah looks up and when he looks up, he sees the glory of God. And it's actually in the midst of a season when King Uzziah has just died, one of the greatest kings in the history of the, of the chosen people. And a lot of people were probably really, really upset. But Isaiah chose to look up, to look for the glory of God. And because, as Jeremiah says to us, seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart, Isaiah saw the Lord. And so that first look is simply to be aware that the glory of God is present in the whole world and to look for what God is doing in every circumstance, in our marriages, in the raising of our children, in the workplace, in our friendships. God is at work and the glory of God is present. I think about the scripture to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. What does a person do when there are major natural things that are screaming out that they need, you know, whether it's finances or a job and, and it, it's almost dominating their whole life. How do they still seek first the kingdom? I think that's such a great question, Amy. And it's obviously the question that faces all of us. And one of the things that I've come to deeply appreciate about this understanding that the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth is it means that I have to do kind of what the Apostle Paul says in, in Philippians, in Philippians chapter four, when he says, don't be anxious about anything. You know, that, that would almost be cruel if in a world where we've got all kinds of anxieties, if Paul didn't tell us what to do instead, but Paul says, you know, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And then he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's good, whatever's excellent, whatever's praiseworthy, whatever's honorable, think about these things. And Paul himself was saying, again, focus on the good things that God is doing in your life. I have a friend right now who has been living with ALS for four years and uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And he has chosen to focus on each day where God is putting life into his day, focusing on making that day his best day with the Lord. And when I get together with him right now and all he can do is move his eyes and, and his computer speaks for him as it tracks his eyes. And yet he spends his time sharing with me the richness of the blessings of what God is doing right then in his life. And I, I, I'm so blessed by talking with him because he gets it, that no matter the depth of the challenges, God is still present and at work and it can do something wonderful in our hearts if we can make the conscious decision to look even in the midst of the challenges for what God is doing. 